So now let's look at the bottom here um, for this stuff. Um, first, real quick, um, we have a lock button in case you don't want someone to accidentally um, delete something, or uh, you could kind of make sure things don't like move around. Or, well, you could still move them around, but you just can't delete anything um, if it's locked. Um, this camera down here will take a snapshot of what's in program, and you could save a PNG. So that's a good if a uh, good tool if you want to send reference or something like that. Um, over here, this will bring up all of your shortcuts, um, and then a shortcut to the web controller. And so because I had that Stinger script uh, checked off to show up in the web controller, I could then activate it from here. So you could see how fast it is um, just going to that port there. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, over here, also how you can see some statistics to how things are behaving on your computer. And then you could also see like all your SRT connections as well here. Um, and then here's this hamburger button. This has some cool stuff for us to go into as well. Data sources, vMix Social, GT Title Designer. Those are all really cool. Um, some quick things in here. Legacy Title Designer is like the older one. Um, these kind of look like paint if you've ever played around with that, um, but they do a lot more powerful things. Um, you could go into vMix Video Tools here if you want to um, set up. If you want to like render an image sequence, you could just do that right in vMix. I just go to Create Image Sequence, and it just uses FFmpeg. Um, you put the source file in, and then you could output it to somewhere, and it'll just do a frame by frame in a PNG sequence. Um, there's a vMix, a, we'll, when we get into recording, we'll look at the codec options. Um, when you record, you could record in a certain way that actually makes it so other computers can't see it unless you do one quick thing to it, but it is more fault tolerant. So we'll look at that in a minute, but uh, that's where you would like uh, fix that so then other people could look at it. Um, and then um, you could index uh, recordings as well, which is kind of a similar thing. Um, so I'm going to get out of that there, and that's pretty much um, this right hand corner. Over here are some playlist features. Um, so I haven't, I don't really use playlists that much, but this is like, oh, I want to like just run these, like preload these files and have them just run automatically. Different than a list input, uh, because you still have to start the first video in the list input or bring in a program or something like that. This is like, oh, I have a TV channel and I just want it to run automatically. This is how you would do that here. Um, and it would, you could just set it to loop forever, stuff like that, and just define what inputs that you want in, and it'll just run itself. Um, over here is multi-quarter. Multi-quarter lets you record a bunch of different channels. You can record NDI channels, you can record camera inputs and vMix calls, um, including the four outputs you have on vMix. So we'll do this a lot. For example, um, for one of the shows that we do pretty often that uses a lot of vMix callers, um, we'll put them on an output so then we could add their audio bus to it and then record it on multi-quarter. Because um, we could actually, actually you could pick their audio input. So it'll record on multi-quarter because that's what it's receiving in from them. Um, so it'll just record everything for you automatically. You don't need to worry about it. Um, so we'll pick like output one and two. Um, and it will keep that on input. So then this will pick up whatever audio bus we assign to it, um, to that output earlier in the recording. Um, and then over here you have some more settings, and this looks very similar to what the record settings are. Um, here you could record a wave sidecar, so that way you could have the audio separated, which is pretty handy. Um, you could do this to split files every few minutes. Something to know, especially with um, something to know, especially with H.264, is that if you have some kind of error, if your computer crashes or the power gets pl unplugged or something like that, and it's not finished recording, you haven't hit stop record, the file can't containerize. And so then it's just going to be a corrupt file and you won't be able to open it or play it because uh, it needs that stop command to like cut it off. Um, so what you can do is set a new file every X minutes to kind of cover your bases that way. Um, especially it also prevents any files from becoming too big. Um, so this is a good way to automatically make sure the cutoff time is what you want it to be. Um, normally I leave NDI to, re to record in the original MOV because that's the highest quality it can be. Um, and then you have a setting to do fault tolerant um, if you want to on H.264. Right now on the vMix AVI codec, 
Uh, I haven't played around with it too much. It's supposed to be good though because um, it is uh, like fault tolerant and then you can, um, it does uses less computing power to actually do the uh, recorded encode. So that's really a great feature here. But you have these other options. You can do regular AVI uh, with whatever codec you want. You could do MKV, same deal. You can do an MP4. This will be H.264 of whichever quality you want or HEVC. Um, you could assign the bitrate here, audio and video. Hardware encoder, that's again using the graphics card. Then you'll see this fault tolerant feature here. If I have this clicked on, now, if I have some kind of failure on my computer or something like that, the recording is still good. However, um, I'm not just going to be able to play it in Premiere or something like that right out of the gate. It is kind of a proprietary thing. Um, instead, I'm going to have to go into um, vMix Video Tools and then index the MOV MP4 recording. Um, so then that way uh, I will be able to use it in other programs. So that's a good way to guarantee your records will be okay. I mean, like, because the computer's crashing anyway, uh, it'll make sure you still, um, anything you had recorded already, you'll still get to keep. Um, and so then again, just be aware of, like, if you're running a ton of multi-quarter channels and streaming and doing SRT and a ton of things, that it is taxing on the machine. Um, if you wanted to do ProRes, you can. You could do that in FFmpeg um, and then pick ProRes here. You could do the MP4 NVENC, which is supposed to be really cool. I haven't played around with that, but it's supposed to be good because it's uh, for NVIDIA cards. Um, and you could go to ProRes, uh, MOV or MOV Index, which is that same deal before about um, if the fault toleration um, video quality here, you could do like LT, standard quality, high quality. Uh, we do LT a lot because it's like pretty much good for our needs. Um, audio quality, keep it PCM. I just don't like using ProRes on vMix because I just find it crashes a lot. Um, you'll, I'll notice the computer can slow to a crawl. Um, I haven't really gotten to the bottom of why it's doing that sometimes. Um, but um, yeah, I just get nervous about doing ProRes records, so I try to do that off board. Uh, plus on the HyperDeck and stuff, I can physically see that it's recording. With this, once I start recording and minimize it, I can't really see what it's recording. Um, but here you'll be able to see if any frames are dropping, um, which is um, why it's, for if we have like an NDI input, especially if it's on a vMix call, that's like not great video signal. Um, so it's dropping frames, but you don't really, it's not enough to notice and everyone kind of accepts that, you know, remote callers have dropped frames. It's not a perfect signal. Um, but if you them through an output, um, you're not going to have some of the same problems as if you recorded the NDI directly, because if you record the NDI directly, drop frames might split the files and make new files. Um, it has a buffer period where if it's like, oh, we haven't received any data for this amount of time or this many frames, we're just going to make a new file. We're going to cease the record, and then when we see it again, we're going to get new, uh, we're going to start a new record file. So sometimes if the caller has like a bad internet connection, we'll see that there's like a ton of files in there. Um, so this way, um, if you have it go through an output, it'll still drop the frames, but at least it won't force new records every time. You don't have to like sift through all the records that get generated. Um, so uh, you'll just start them from over here. You can also start them by clicking on multi-quarter here. Similarly is record over here. I'm just going to click on the settings. Basically the same, it's just these settings are on this column here. Same thing as before, um, except this WMV option as well, which I've never used. Um, and then you could record a wave here. And then you get two records that are different than the multi chords. Because multi chords are like, oh, I want to record just this input. But record is like, oh, I want to record one of these outputs. Um, so normally you'll do record one on output one, record two on output two, and then that and enabled. And then that's how you get your clean and dirty um, by the way you had it set up before. So you'll see the same settings here fault toleration, hardware encoder, the H.264 settings, stuff like that. So all that is pretty much the same. You could add a little bit of delay if you know you need it um, over here. So I'll use this as really my main recorder um, when I'm like recording something for vMix on there. Um, I'm just going to disable this. Um, but yeah, it's pretty good. And you could pick um, a place to record it to. A lot of times we'll use the hot swaps on the uh, PBOT and record to an SSD there. So then that way, when it comes time to ingest them, we just pull them out and plug them into a computer on a NAS and download it there. So uh, it's really nice to be able to have that flexibility with it. Um, so yeah, so there's that. So now streaming, um, it, we, I like using vMix as an encoder um, only because that gives us the ability to, you know, fly in some graphics, a slate or something like that. If we wanted to, if we had like a primary backup switcher, we could have 
them run to one encoder and then that way we could switch right on here where we're pulling from. Um, I like being able to have those options and instead of like, you know, the Clearcaster workflow or a normal hardware encoder where we are left with whatever signal we're pushing to it, we can't like change our minds about it or alter it at all. Um, this at least gives us the flexibility that we have with the vMix. However, it is software based, so there is of course some uh, inherent unreliability, um, more so than you get with a hardware encoder, but as long as you're, you know, following good practices with using vMix and using software, you should be okay, or at least know what the limitations are, right? So let's look in the stream settings here. Um, over here you'll find you could add a profile. Um, so this is just a, a way to save um, three, up to three streams so you don't have to type them in from scratch every time if you know they're going to be the same. Um, but here you see one, two, three. These are for three simultaneous streams. Um, th that is the maximum that you could do on vMix. If you want to um, start one individually, you can just... Um, here, let me go to custom RTMP here. Um, you could go here to hit start one, two, two or three, and then if you um, uh, hit this up arrow, you also get a choice there of starting just one, just two, just three, or all of them at once. Um, so over here, we could have things of three separate settings. Um, so I could just uncheck to use stream one quality for two or three, and then I could give it its own thing. So you know how YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter all have their own encoding settings. So you could set them up over here to all be different, but you could still have one button to start all streams, which is pretty cool. Um, and then again, here's the hardware encoder. So you could have that turned on for a stream. Um, we'll use FFmpeg for everything pretty much. Um, and then, yeah, we pretty, for LiveX, we, Traditionally, only do RTMPs to everything uh, on the stream. We don't do any of these directs because these typically don't let you have a preview window. You have to, as soon as you hit live on here, you go live on the platform, which is efficient. But we can't really confirm that the platform is seeing and hearing everything that it's supposed to be seeing and hearing. So, um, so we like being able to use RTMP because if you use RTMP, then you get the back end for most of the social platforms. So you'll input the URL here, the stream key here, and then in advanced, um, like what happens when we use Wowza, um, there's a username and password for authentication. So you could enter that over here and hit OK. And then you could change the quality here. Um, so you could do bitrate size and code size. Um, something we've done vMix to Instagram Live before. We we don't really do that anymore because it's um, not very. It's never has been supported by Instagram. They've all been kind of hacks and workarounds. And the one that was working really well just like disappeared overnight. <laughs> um, so and so far the ones that we've been trying to um, replace it with haven't been as great great at doing it. For example, like everything that's out right now, you go live before you get an RTMP key. So that means you're live on black until you can input the RTMP key into your encoder and start streaming to it. So it is always like five to 10 seconds at least of black and nothing. And of course, that's when the notification gets sent out to everyone. So it's not like the best experience. I kind of try to steer people away from doing it, but you can do that here. And because Instagram needs vertical video, um, you just go to the encode side here, the encode size here, and instead of making it say 16.9, um, you'd make this uh, 9.16. So I just changed this to be, you know, 1080 by 19.20. And now what it'll do is it will center crop, um, kind of like how you see here. Um, it'll center crop this and only send that out um, instead of stretching it down or anything like that. So um, you'll just have to be aware of your frame size because you'll still see a 16.9, um, but it will actually stream in vertical video, which is pretty cool. Um, then you have some more, you could pick what source you're streaming here. You could pick um, profile H.264 you want to do, some details here. Um, you could change the keyframe frequency, which also refers to the GOP. Uh, but notice you can only do that for stream one. You can't alter this for additional streams on vMix, which is uh, kind of funky, I guess. I guess because they, they all need to be the same. Um, but so if like you have a platform that needs a different free keyframe frequency than everything else, you'll have to do that on a separate device. Um, then you could decide how many threads you want to be able to use, um, uh, any network buffer. Normally I don't touch any of this. Um, sometimes I will touch, however, strict CBR. And so there are two things, there's CBR and VBR. Um, it stands for constant bitrate versus variable bitrate. And basically what that means is when you're streaming, a lot of times you'll put a variable bitrate because it won't encode things that it doesn't need to. So if you're on a still, a still image or something, a lot of times on the platforms you'll notice that you sometimes get warnings because your bitrate's too low, but it's not actually because you're streaming too low, it's because you're on an adaptive bitrate or a variable bitrate, um, and it's not 
encoding using as much uh, of the bitrate that it's allowed to because it doesn't need to. It's like, oh, I've already done, I've already rendered all these pixels. I don't need to worry about it anymore. If I did a CBR, that would no matter what, always send like for whatever I set it to. So if like I set this to six um, megs, it'll just send six megs out regardless of what's in the frame or how often it's changing. Um, so some platforms like CBR better. YouTube does just because its warnings are really annoying about um, saying that you're not streaming at a fast enough rate. Um, but if you do a CBR, that tends to go away. Um, one thing you do want to know is you want to be very sure that you have good internet if you're going to do CBR because it's not going to be able to adjust in case your internet is having issues. So typically it will you know, do the best it can do under your network conditions. But if it's CBR, it's like, nope, I'm doing 4.5 or 6 or whatever you set it to, no matter what, no matter whether it's actually making it there or not. So um, that's something to be aware of. And then one thing I like to do here in streaming is always save and close to make sure I'm saving the signals. Oh, so sorry, I'm going to cancel out of that. And then make sure I'm saving and closing um, to make sure I'm actually getting all my changes and then going from here to stream. Um, so I start stream one there. So yeah, that's pretty much um, streaming from vMix.